I am Dracula. Welcome, YouTube friend, to a new world of gods and monsters. Well, not exactly new, but it's still a cool line. Today we're going to be talking about Universal's Frankenstein series, the first ever long-running horror movie franchise, and one of the earliest cinematic examples of the law of diminishing returns. In February of 1931, Universal released Dracula, and began what is commonly referred to today as the Monster Cycle. Dracula was directed by Todd Browning and starred Hungarian actor Bela Lugosi in the title role. Naturally, when it came time for Universal to adapt Mary Shelley's classic novel Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus that very same year, Lugosi was offered the role of the monster. Supposedly, he turned the part down due to the lack of dialogue and the pounds of lead-based makeup that would have covered his face. However, Todd Browning did shoot test footage of Lugosi as the monster, so he must have considered the part at one point. Although Lugosi didn't take the role in the end, several other actors and crew members transferred over from Dracula to Frankenstein, including Dwight Fry and Edward Van Sloan. In the director's chair though, it wasn't Todd Browning this time, but visionary filmmaker James Whale, who, just months after Dracula, made Browning's style feel quaint and outdated. On the off chance that you're watching this video having never actually seen the film, I suppose I should explain the story. We start with a hilarious and often parodied introduction from Edward Van Sloan, warning us that what we're about to see is really shocking. But then we move on to the film proper. Colin Clive plays Henry Frankenstein, a scientist obsessed with creating life. He and his assistant Fritz, played by Dwight Fry, have been robbing graves to get the necessary body parts to build a man from scratch. Fritz screws the experiment up though by putting an abnormal brain inside his master's creation, and when the creature comes to life, it seems that Frankenstein has made a monster. Obviously there's a lot more to the story than that, but since this is a review and not a blow-by-blow -blow account of every single thing that happens, I hope that will suffice in terms of giving you a little context. It's worth noting that several cuts were made to the film by censors who found it too shocking and violent. Famously, the line, now I know what it feels like to be God, was cut due to its blasphemous nature. The way they cut the line was rather clever, using the loud thunderstorm outside to cover Henry's voice. Interestingly enough, the Legacy Collection DVD contains the uncut version, but the subtitles have been taken from the censored release. The censors also chopped out this now classic scene where the young girl Maria is drowned. It's a great scene, and I'm glad to see it restored. Apparently James Whale was so impressed with actress Marilyn Harris's cheerful can-do attitude when doing multiple takes of this scene that when they were finished he told her she could have her favourite snack, whatever that was, at which point she asked for a dozen hard-boiled eggs, suggesting she may in fact have been one of Gaston's many illegitimate children. Watching Frankenstein in 2020, it's hard to believe that it's almost 90 years old. It has a timeless quality to it. A lot of that is down to Whale's direction. The sets are gothic and stylish, drawing inspiration from German Expressionism. Sound design is very strong too. Despite the lack of a full musical score, storm sounds, wind, crowd noises, electrical buzzing sounds all fill your ears and you never feel like you're watching a stage play, which was a common problem for early talkies. Production value is very high. Despite a slightly reduced budget from Dracula, at least according to IMDb, Frankenstein looks like a huge expensive movie. Some visual highlights include the torch-wielding mob in the climax, the iconic laboratory scene, and this incredibly powerful long take. The staging here is fantastic. Notice how the extras react at different times. They don't all realise at once, but after a while each one starts to realise the horror of what's been going on during their celebration. It's emotional stuff, and it's shot in a very modern and very ambitious fashion. You didn't see this kind of filmmaking back then. Both aesthetically and thematically, you can feel the influence Frankenstein had on a whole generation of filmmakers. Whale's obvious affinity for outcasts and oddballs, as well as scenes like these, bring to mind the works of Tim Burton, a modern mainstream director who's taken more than a couple of things from the Frankenstein movies. The acting is also a high point. Colin Clive is sensational as Henry Frankenstein, bringing intensity, presence and uh, humanity to a role that could have just been another cackling mad scientist if played by a lesser actor. I was surprised to learn that this was only Clive's second ever film role. 
his only prior credit being Journey's End, which was also directed by Whale. I was equally shocked to discover that Clive was only 31 during the making of this film. He certainly looks mature and experienced. Although a lot of that isn't because of makeup or acting, but instead due to the myriad of health problems Clive suffered. He sadly died very young. As for the supporting cast, Boris Karloff gives a star-making performance as the monster, bringing a level of pathos and sympathy to the hulking beast, even under Jack Pierce's iconic makeup. Without a single line of dialogue, the monster still sticks out in your mind as a great piece of acting, even after the movie is over. Dwight Fry is also very funny and a little creepy as the Hunchback Fritz. May Clark is likeable and does a fine job as Henry's fiancée Elizabeth. And Frederick Kerr is hilarious as Baron Frankenstein. And a darn pretty girl to come back to. <laughs> Will you tell me that? Baron, you don't understand. I understand perfectly well. <laughs> There's another woman. And you're afraid to tell me. Pretty sort of experiments these must be. <laughs> Sadly, he died between the first two movies, so he doesn't return for the sequel. And instead, we have James Whale's friend Una O'Connor providing the laughs in the next one. Now, I'm probably not going to win any friends in the Monster Film fan club by admitting this, but I just don't like Edward Van Sloan, uh, who plays Henry's mentor, Dr. Waldman. I didn't like him in Dracula either. I find him uncharismatic, flat, and really, really dull, especially when he's sharing the screen with top-notch talent like Clive and Karloff. Sorry. <laughs> And while I'm nitpicking little things that don't really matter, the first time we get a proper look at the monster is just... weird. He kind of moonwalks into the room, presumably so the audience can't see his face. He turns slowly... and then we're given these peculiar jump cuts. The moment is a bit off-putting. But the final close-up that we do get of Karloff wearing Pierce's makeup is pretty great. Karloff removed his dental plates uh, to give his cheeks a sunken look. The monster may not be the main character. In fact, he only gets fourth billing, but it's clear that he's the star in James Whale's eyes, as well as the eyes of most fans, a fact that would play into the sequel. What makes Carlos monster so interesting is that he doesn't seem to conform to a moral binary that audiences uh, would have expected. Frankenstein is not a humans good, monsters bad kind of movie. It's smarter than that. The monster is as much a victim as the townspeople he terrorises. Yes, he is a violent brute, but he's also the product of an abnormal brain and a pretty abusive and short upbringing at the hands of his brilliant but uh, careless creator. By the film's disturbing conclusion, you'll no doubt find yourself feeling sorry for a creature that, for all intents and purposes, is a murderous beast. It may be a black and white movie, but the characters occupy a grey moral space. Frankenstein was a huge financial success, and while critics were fairly mixed on the film, mostly positive but there were some pretty mean reviews too, audiences were enraptured. It made Boris Karloff a household name, and ensured that Frankenstein's creation would go down in history as one of the greatest monsters of all time. I love this film. I could talk about it all day, but there are many sequels to discuss. In 1935, Film sequels were still quite a new concept, and with the Hays Code now in full swing, you'd be forgiven for having modest expectations. Bride of Frankenstein is, however, arguably better than the first. James Whale returns to the directing role, bringing with him all the cinematic mastery he learned from doing high-profile horror films like The Old Dark House and The Invisible Man. Clive and Karloff are also back, as is the monster makeup maestro himself, Jack Pierce. Now, let's talk a little bit about the story. We open with a pretty weird scene of Elsa Lanchester as Mary Shelley talking to her husband Percy and their friend Lord Byron about her Frankenstein story. It's a rather camp framing device, but it does give a pretty creative excuse to recap the first film in a sort of previously on Frankenstein way. Of course, back then there was no home video, so it was likely that many audience members would have needed their memories jogging a bit. Once Mrs. Shelley starts telling the rest of the story, though, the film just gets better and better. We start at the ruins of the mill from the first picture. Now, four years may have passed for the audience, but for the torch-wielding mob, it's still the same night they enacted vigilante justice on Frankenstein's creation. Once the mob has been dispersed, Hans, the father of the little girl who died in the last movie, investigates the wreckage of the mill in order to confirm that the monster is dead and to satisfy his need for revenge. Unfortunately for Hans, the monster is not dead, just a little toasted. 
Karloff's first appearance is much more effective this time round. His detailed makeup shows burns to the skin. Some of his hair has been singed away too, revealing metal pieces that presumably hold his skull together. Jack Pierce's redesign is a great piece of continuity. Seeing all the damage the monster took from the mill fire makes him seem almost like a mortal man. The story follows the monster's journey after escaping the mill. Predictably, he suffers a lot of abuse at the hands of humans, but eventually makes friends with a lonely blind man living in an isolated cabin. The friendship they share is honestly quite beautiful and is a high point in the film. Karloff's acting really shines during the sequences where his new friend shows him kindness and even teaches him to speak. Without wishing to spoil a film that came out in 1935, as you can imagine, the monster's happiness doesn't last. Henry Frankenstein feels a lot more like a supporting character this time around, having far less to do than in the last picture. This may have had to do with just how ill Colin Clive was during filming. His alcoholism had very much taken hold at this point, as well as his tuberculosis. Sadly, Clive would die only two years after Bride of Frankenstein released. He was 37. Henry has a far more passive role in the narrative than you might expect if you were to watch the two films back to back. While recovering in bed and being comforted by his fiancée Elizabeth, who has mysteriously transformed from May Clark to Valerie Hobson, he is visited by his old friend Professor Septimus Pretorius, played with a lot of gusto by the great Ernest Thesiger. Pretorius has been successful in his strange experiments, growing tiny people that he calls the Humunculans. Now, these special effects I think are really, really impressive, especially for 1935. Pretorius wants to combine his research with Frankenstein's, using Henry's technique of building full-sized bodies and using his own method to grow a brand new brain from scratch. Henry is at first intrigued by the idea, but turns down the offer. Pretorius, though, is a manipulative bastard and does whatever he needs to get what he wants going as far as to involve the monster in his nefarious schemes. Bride of Frankenstein is a technical triumph. The special effects are awesome. It also has a fully orchestrated musical score. The pacing is very strong too. And in spite of its really macabre subject matter, it feels far less like a horror movie than its predecessor. Instead, we get a strange and tragic human drama with horror trappings. And it's all the better for it. Once again, the acting is superb. Karloff has been pushed into the starring role here. This time he has top billing, and he injects so much human emotion into the performance. Karloff didn't want the monster to speak. He felt it was a stupid idea, famously remarking, if the monster had any impact or charm, it was because he was inarticulate. But you know what? I'm just going to say it. Karloff was wrong. Giving the monster a voice gives us a deeper look into the intricacies of his sadness, the complexity of his soul and his longing for affection. Ernest Thesinger is great as always. Pretorius is one of my favorite movie villains and so much of that and so much of that is thanks to just how much fun he's clearly having in the role. Colin Clive, while very sick, still brings his A game to the performance and manages to deliver a worthy farewell to the character. The titular bride doesn't show up until the last few minutes of the film, but her design is iconic and Elsa Lanchester's swan-like performance is certainly memorable. I mentioned the Hayes Code a little while ago. Now, for those who may not know, the Hayes Code was a mandatory code of moral standards for films produced at the time. Scripts needed to be submitted and approved by the censor's office to ensure they reflected decent moral standards. Here's an actual quotation from the code. No picture shall be produced that will lower the moral standards of those who see it, hence the sympathy of the audience should never be thrown to the side of crime, wrongdoing, evil or sin. It may seem like a sequel to Frankenstein, the movie about a man playing God by robbing graves would be damn near impossible in such a climate, but by throwing in some references to messing with God's creation and lines of dialogue like this, I might even have found the secret of eternal life. Henry, don't say those things. Don't think them. It's blasphemous and wicked. We are not meant to know those things. They were able to get away with some really shocking stuff, including Jesus imagery with the monster. On the subject of censorship, the film's Japanese release cut this moment. The Japanese censors found it offensive because it, quote, made a fool of a king, which is just about the most charming thing I've ever heard. Putting the two films side by side, it's clear that the second one is a far greater achievement, but I do have some nitpicks. 
The casting of Dwight Fry as the grave robber Carl is baffling to me. Seeing the exact same actor who the monster hanged in the previous movie suddenly back as a different but similar character is such a weird choice and it just kind of broke the immersion for me the first time I watched the movie. I have mixed feelings about Una O'Connor. Occasionally her sass and sarcasm is very funny, but she can also be quite grating, especially when she's shrieking at the top of her lungs. I also didn't care much for Valerie Hobson as Elizabeth. Her acting isn't bad by any means, but her performance is so noticeably different to Mae Clark that it can be distracting. In spite of those little tiny nitpicks though, I do love both films and I cannot recommend them enough. When watched back to back, I would say that they both have a lot of different things to offer. The first one is a far more effective horror movie, atmospheric, ambitious and very well acted. The second one is a better drama and a far more emotional experience, but it's not as scary. They complement each other very well and create a very bombastic, yet at the same time human story that's really something special. If you're the type of person who doesn't watch a lot of old films because they're slow paced, I'd still recommend the first two Frankenstein movies. They're fairly short, very ambitious, very dramatic and exciting. Now with the story seemingly concluded, there was no need to continue the franchise. But as is still the case today with franchises that seem to keep going long after the story has been told, the Frankenstein movies would continue, but without James Whale. Join me next time as we take a look at the next phase in the Universal Frankenstein series. But until then, thank you for watching, and thank you to all my patrons. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more like it, why not subscribe and enable notifications. I'll see you next time I hope.